Uh, okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, okay, most of you have been very nice, and we'll be talking about harnessing the power of network data. Um, this tags on to the presentation that um, Arun and um, uh, Antonio did in the main tent where they demonstrated uh, connecting a partner and mapping. This more talks about the, um, the user. So let me start by defining what network data is. Uh, I define it's a combination of data from your um, ERP system, your training partner systems, network applications, you know, like Elemica's logistics or Elemica's VMI applications, plus outside data feeds. And so in the graphic there, the transaction data is down the dark ones in the lower left. It tends to be um, uh, structured data. And then as you move out to the right, you get more into um, you know, various non-structured sets of data. So in line with what Rich and John talked about earlier today, um, Elemica's model is we want to connect the, the structured data from the ERP, the trading partner systems, network applications. So that's what, that's the hard data that we have in our, in our next generation network. We want to be able to add the outside data feeds into that so that we can do things with it. That's part of our um, let me move this out of the way so we can see everything here. That record button was blocking the slide. So a um, little bit of research here. You know, network data is disruptive, and it's uh, the next frontier of supply chain innovation. So this is from Supply Chain World, uh, September 2014. You can see that the digital supply chain, big data analytics, Internet of Things, cloud computing, all rank very highly for disruptive technologies. That's really what we're talking about here. Um, the Boston Consulting Group uh, in uh, you know, one of the papers in January said the combination of large, fast-moving, fast varied data streams, um, advanced tools and techniques represent the next frontier of supply chain innovation. And so that, that's, you know, where we see ourselves. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I've um, read is that, you know, the 21st century was, um, the big currency was oil and power. You know, in this century, it's more around data and information. You know, that's the new currency. Whoever has better information is going to win. So, Alemica ran a focus group earlier this year, and keep have to move, keep having to move this uh, recording thing around. And we looked at, we got information. Hey, what are the types of things that um, you know in the customer service function keep you up at night? Um, so the ones in black relate to you know execution and um, uh, you know just running the company. In blue is transportation, and in red um, are things like government requirements, serialization, food and pharma. And so when we talked it through, we concluded that network data addresses about. 90% of the concerns. Now, it's not going to help you with the strategic direction of the company. You know, it's not going to really help you necessarily with experimental samples or a strike. But a lot of the things like, um, uh, you know, rail performance, um, uh, you know, track and trace, network data really can help you with. And examples of that um, are, you know, will my carrier's performance for lane XYZ be worse or better than expected based on all known data? So you know, as we get more and more information into our into our network and are able to mine it for you, these are the kinds of questions we want to be able to answer. Another one is, um, you know, track and trace is a big one. Let's say batch XYZ has some kind of problem. Okay, in our Juno system, you could um, type in that batch number, search across, and basically see every instance of where that data is in our system. That's hard, and that'd be hard in your SAP system. You know, if you typed in a batch number in your SAP system, would you be able to see where it is on a on a truck? Yeah. And in our 1.0 system, it's probably pretty difficult too. But in 2.0, we'll our data model is normalized across all the transactions, and everything flows into the same data model. So you could see it across all of the. If, if that batch was in our system, you could see it across all of the um, across all the data flows. So how do we get the data? Um, this talks a little bit to standards. So there's a funny quote, you know, I see Larry smiling. The nice thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. Who is that? Tenenbaum. 
You know, I'm not sure, but it rings familiar. I mean, I think he's a software guy. You can probably Google him. And, and who here in the room um, is connected to anyone via like X12? I see some hands. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you if you look at a standard like X12, X12 850, do you ever do you all your trading partners use the 850 the same way? No. No. Right. They're all different. And then you know, then you layer on net effect, net effect order. You now you have the same problem. So even though there's data standards out there, people don't use them the same way. And I I laugh every time um, a new group comes about and says we're going to solve the world standardization problem. So I'm rolling out a new data standard. I just crack up laughing. I'm like, all that does is it adds more confusion to the to the to the puzzle. Yeah, I know. We we found out pretty quickly that uh, not everyone adhered to our thoughts on how to use ChemXML, especially our customers. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And I was actually at Ag Gateway last year, and I asked the question. I said, "Hey, which of the Ag Gateway standards are you using? You know, for, for an order?" And different people raised their hands. So even with Ag Gateway standards, different companies are using different standards. So we have a it's the standards from Red Hat Gateway. Yeah. The standards called Hat Gateway, but they have at least three other standards all underneath of it. Exactly. Red Hat Data, and I think Hat Data is actually another standard standard. Right, so you have to have some sort of network help to translate across them. There, there's a group in Europe. Yeah, any chance you want. Know. <laughs> There's a group in Europe called Pebble. It's um, P E P P O L, and it's um, basically public procurement. And so, you know, I was dealing with some emails today where someone said, "Oh, hey, Pebble is solving the world's problems. And all you have to do is connect into the Pebble network, and um, you know, your invoices will flow anywhere that they have to flow automatically, and it's free." And you know, then I, you know, I, I had research this before I knew the answer. I'm like, I don't think that's how it works. You know, it's really Pebble is just an umbrella organization for different standards, and there is no network, there is no standards. It's just it's like another uh, gateway. So a bit of a digression there. But um, just looking at this slide, you know, how do we get the data? You know, companies will tend to send their standard, but then there's different identifier values. Over time, you know, requirements evolve. There's a desire to uh, interpret non-structured your data, we see that we have non-standard use of standards. So it's just this, um, you know, circular puzzle. And uh, an article uh, it was written by some, uh, you know, thinkers at SAP in, in December of 2013 called Iterative Reduction and B2B Schema Integration via a Canonical Data Model. Basically, what they concluded was you had to have a data model in between all the companies that you would. Um, take the various standards translated into a common data, data model so you could send anything in and get anything out. And that's what Lemica you know, has been you know, doing for about 15 years, you know, with limited success because of some of the things how we architected the network originally. So we want to, you know, move beyond that. And that you know, design of our next generation network that I'm going to talk about here. Um, Boston Consulting Group wrote an article in June of this year said often companies' data definitions are inconsistent and this produces value. And, you know, we see this all the time. So with our evolving canonical model, what we... Um, what we did was we looked at modeling real-world supply chain processes. So, you know, with an awareness of what, how SIDEX organized data, how X12, how that affect how IDOC, you know, they all organize data a little bit differently. There's some commonalities. So then we had to ask ourselves, do we try to make Alemica's internal data model look like SIDEX, or should we make it look like X12? And what we decided was generally let's model how the real world works, um, as opposed to trying to model a data standard. So and I can show you examples of this. Um, but basically, you know, we built in things like serialization, track and trace, complex packaging. You know, we thought, okay, how are the ways you could package something? You know, how do you need to show that? And built that into our into our central data model. And we shared that data model across all the messages and applications. So 
if we define a product a certain way in the order create, it's defined identically in the invoice and the ship notice and all the transportation messages. So we have this core strong base of common data structures that are being used. Now as we're migrating people over to 2.0, you know, we're finding some things. Hey, we're going to try to map the IDOC. You know, we're having this issue. We'll look at it. And while we're in these early stages, we're teaching those structures across everything. We want to have everything be very consistent. So how do you structure? structures? The central data structures won't be customized. They'll be central, they'll be Olympus structures. Now, um, as if we have to add to them or change them in the early stages where we're seeing some, we're trying to make them more robust so that hopefully we don't have to add too much to them. Superset. Superset, yeah. And, and we designed it so, like, for example, if we have a new label type, we didn't build that as a data structure. We built that as a as an attribute within That's existing data structure. Yeah, characteristics. You inherit the base object. Yes, that's right. So we, we created the base objects, and then also a thought process in terms of, um, and I'm not that technical, so in terms of, in ter if we have to add something to it, um, we try to think ahead and say, okay, if we add it, it'll probably be added here, therefore it's not going to impact any of the paths that exist. So we try to think through how do we add things so that we don't, if we have to add things, because we know we aren't thinking, we can't think of everything that might happen, how do we build it so that we don't... Um, yeah, the unique path remains unique. Yep. And we used, you know, attributes. So we thought about, you know, as we're doing things, I'm constantly thinking, especially in the early stages of it, as we're, you know, mapping to it, if someone wants to change, I'm trying to think very holistically about what to do from a supply chain perspective, backward compatibility, you know, all, and mapping efficiency. That's my role is building the governance around that and building the systems and processes. I can show you, like, some of the tracking tools we have and, um, so that, that's, you know, some of the attributes of our model. Um, there's six main business processes, uh, finance, you know, invoice message, payments, et cetera, logistics, order management, quality, serialization. Actually going to change that to tolling because serialization is one part of tolling and we're getting some requirements to start sending um, uh, recipes and, you know, yeah, and complex toll scenarios. Complex toll scenarios, yeah. I want to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. And so with a lot of this stuff, we basically just decided to build in, like, I used the model, I tried to model um, basically a sub, one of the models I used to take a hard case, a submarine having to order perishable plasma that has different expiration dates and have it delivered to a, to a GPS coordinate. And then have en route tracking of you know of a, of a time window when a helicopter can meet a surfacing submarine. So I, I wanted to take some really complex things and see, okay, can we model that? Because if we can do that, we can handle sending a truck. Yeah, everything we're going to do is simpler. So we're ready for drone delivery. Yeah, and we can, we can deliver stuff to a mountaintop in Afghanistan via mule. Um, you know, some examples of the new functions. Um, this is out of an uh, uh, article. Um, basically, you know, the farmer's ability to locate a precise precision location in a field lets us uh, track, essentially, what fertilizer is, is put onto each seed. So if, if a company is able to, um, you know, track that, send the data to us, you start linking up batch numbers with, okay, this, this uh, set of crops had this many fertilizer applications. You can track that through the food supply chain and have you know auditability back to you know when it was put in the ground and what treatments occurred even before the you know plant emerged. That's so, precision and tracking. Thank you. Yes, all around the stuff. Oh yeah, and I, I listened in on those things to fit, to make sure we handled those requirements. I also worked with uh, guys that are uh, you know salespeople, sales reps that are working in pharma to make sure okay hey let's let's hit the pharma stuff uh, because we wanted to just build it out and I hit the DOD um, you know one guy that I work with Domin, you know, he did a lot of stuff with DLA, I have some, you know, experience in it, so we wanted to hit some of these pretty tough scenarios and see if we could uh, cover everything across them. So 
some you know examples of new functions. Um, we allow a consumer, you know, the, the orderer to basically specify batch numbers and expirations. Uh, you're shaking your head, Renee. Do you uh, see that occurring? Um, well, yeah, that's, that's one thing. You know, where a customer is sending an order and they want a particular batch, yeah. and the, the CSR wants that batch in the sales order, and you know, they don't want to have to send it. And like Cydex today, which a lot of Alemica is modeled on, doesn't support that sort of thing. So we built that in. You know, we just built it in Corridor Network. Even what we want to do is get ahead of the ERPs so that once your customer can send it and you can receive it, we're not on the critical path. You know, we have it. We're ready to go. I think that was Yeah. I've seen that. I talked uh, with... Uh, uh, head of quality of their hands, for example. Um, and uh, they might know a specific batch has certain characteristics. It's all within the control limits of the COA. But they know that that batch is in a certain band, and that's going to give them the performance characteristics. If they get that batch, they mix it a certain way as opposed to a different batch. We get something similar yeah, they're working inside the control limits of the of the of the spec. But in theory, all the all the products that Yeah, and maybe maybe as they use that batch and they did some special stuff and they know we, this is what we did with that batch. Therefore, let me get it again because I know what I did and I don't have to replicate it. Yeah. Yeah, bio, you'll see it. Top tire manufacturing, Michelin, you know, they're like French um, chefs, you know, making the tires. Yeah. Oh, the spice is a little bit more spicy, so I'll use less of it. <laughs> yeah. So my, my philosophy on this from a product management standpoint is if I hear something more than a couple of times and it kind of fits in, I'm like, if I can add it without any detriment, I'm just going to do it without thinking too much about it because it makes sense. No. So I said that some of this is from like the L5 warehouse where batch number tracking is <laughs> yeah, and, and so what we did was we then we looked at to solve batch numbers specifically. Then we looked at okay, well, you also could have a batch might have multiple lots. So let's have lot as an attribute that might be independent of batch. And then we looked at pharma. What are all the different ways they characterize it? So we added all those specific attributes out there. Serialization came in there too. Yeah. 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 Another one is we have stronger support, much stronger for packaged goods. You know, a multi-customer pallet with multiple drop-offs. So imagine you create a pallet, put it on a truck, and it's a mixed pallet. So when you get to the first stop, pull a couple of things off. Get to the next stop, pull a couple of other things off. We want to think about those data structures because they're hard to do in Sidex right now, but we know that people really do them in real life. And then, you know, Multiple serialized layers, serialized labels per packaging layer. Because you might have three serial numbers, you know, in a, in a manufacturing situation. Maybe one component, maybe there's three components, each with their own monitor serial number, um, you know, keyboard serial number, you know, that kind of thing. They could be on the outside of the box. And geospatials, uh, latitude, longitude, elevation, depth. So basically, it's almost like an or. Um, you can identify a location by a, by a ship to ID, or you know you can put in the geospatials, or do both. And when we have them in the data structures, what we can start to do is things like um, um, if what we get is a ship to ID, if we wanted to, we could then process our data store to put in geospatials on top of it, and then we could do geospatial analysis even if you never sent us a geospatial. So that's out there a little ways, but we're trying to think about those kinds of things so that we can improve the value of our data store and let you get more from it. Yeah, yeah exactly. But if you have to uh, do a, a one-time drop-off, maybe you do want to get you know latitude, longitude, or grid coordinate or something like that, like for a farmer in the field. Hey, can you deliver it exactly to this uh, location? Because they want to have the truck dispatched, you know, not to a street address, but to a specific part of the field. Okay, 
Yeah. 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 Check on a specific site that doesn't have any address yet. Yeah, there's no ship to ID. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, it's not even there. So we just want to think through these things. We see these things happening in other industries, so why not support it in ours? And that lets us extend. And then basically a strong, consistent data model. You know, one of my watchwords was consistency. You know, and thinking through if I wanted to construct a query, is it going to be simple? Because we'll, I'm sure we all working through SAP, uh, doing warehouse projects, reporting projects, know how hard reporting can be. So I kind of look at it like we're inherently putting the, performing the ETL function um, into a data warehouse when your data is mapped into our network. Five o'clock on the nose. So um, I'm the only thing standing between you and wine. So with that, any questions? Yeah, no, that's why I'm standing over here. Yeah. Yes. So we do have we do have it on the network, and some people are using it, but not a whole lot. Yeah. That's one I personally see value in. Yeah, I think the way the Cydex structure is stored, it's yeah. It's terrible. So what we need to do is what do you guys implement? The quality, the quality oh, document? No, I looked at it once. Okay, I've got a couple of requests for it. Um there's other standards that support quality documents. Um, yeah. yeah, but I haven't implemented it either because it's, it's it's usually a more intimate relationships between JPs and stuff. We get those yeah, requests. We kind of customer request for it and never so if, if, you, if you wanted to do COA, because I'll be the first to admit our COA data structure is limited by what we know. We don't have a lot of experience with it. I mean, we understand the, the space pretty well. If you wanted to do it, it wouldn't be that hard to create the new data structure or network and using the tools that Arun showed you, mapping from your chosen standard for it into our data structures, you know, is pretty straightforward. I mean, the first one would have to think through it. But we, I haven't had anybody ask me, but it could be because nobody wants to implement Yeah, 
from our perspective, you know, and, and we, we can relook at it. We actually think that the logic that we have is generally the right logic. That what we would ideally drive to, and I know that it would be um, having the change automated into the ERP, because if the change was automated, then it wouldn't have, it wouldn't be an issue. Right. I agree with you. That's right, because basically, if we, the logic that we have works across the entire spectrum of use cases. So what we did was we changed the logic to meet this one use case that's, you know, driven by not having a change, it would break other scenarios. I can't, I don't, at the time, I didn't have to do that. Actually, let me stop this here. And finally, that's it. Just my contact information if you don't know how to reach out to me and you want more information.